All right. Thanks, Jess. Um, yeah, this is, uh, I'm glad we have the opportunity to do uh, four tutorials. Um, and I've I'm glad to be go. Uh, we're glad to be going last because I could listen to the first three. So this is the the best spot. Um, all right. Well, today as part of multi-phase week, uh, John and I are going to be talking about um, forward modeling your cosmological simulations um, into uh, X-ray observables and uh, analyzing them like X-ray observers do. Um, and by the way, this is uh, primarily John's code, and I've been lucky to use it and um, um, start a project, um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but I wanted to do some motivation first um, as to, you know, what are the, some of the key questions that we hope to, to tackle, um, and this is by, by no means an exhaustive list, um, but I think this is a good week to, to talk about this. Um, so, um, you know, how does a hot X-ray halo medium influence the cool um, UV traced phase. I think we are very interested in that this week. Um, what is the metallicity of the X-ray CGM? I think we will be talking a lot about metallicity throughout this whole uh, um, whole uh, program. And this has a lot of implications for uh, the density and temperature uh, and density and pressure, especially that you measure in the, uh, the X-ray phase. Um, this is a fun, we should do this as a survey question. At what halo mass does the hot phase dominate over the cool phase? Um, uh, and there's always the, 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 uh, the, the long-lasting missing baryons problem um, in the halo perspective. Um, where are the missing baryons? Are they hot? Are they ejected from the halo? Or a combination of both? Um, and this is something, uh, question five is something that I'm you know, uh, and, and my collaborators are really interested in what, where does the hot halo uh, gas originate from? From galactic processes, is it feedback driven? Is it associated with, um, with the baryon cycle? It definitely is in lower mass galaxies. Um, or uh, is it with halo processes, uh, virilization? Um, and of course, there's the uh, question of, does the hot gas precipitate out of the halo and does it reach the galaxy, does it feed galaxy formation? And how does that vary with halo mass, uh, with redshift, et cetera? Um, I put this um, flow chart together without checking with John, but um, this is kind of the idea of what we will be talking about today, um, where you take a simulation, um, uh, whether it be gadget uh, or repo, uh, or gizmo-based simulation, and um, John has worked, uh, um, has started working with Enzo uh, before I ever joined, uh, collaborating with him. Um, and there's a number of other simulations, but generally John has written his software so he can take these different uh, simulation formats in the YT framework. Um, and uh, he will be talking about Pi Um And that takes these uh, gas, you know, uh, these gaseous, um, halos, uh, uh, simulations, takes their physical data, density, temperature, uh, 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 abundances, and converts them into an X-ray photon list. And then there's another step um, to get to your mock X-ray observation. So you have a photon list, um, and uh, John's code SOXES um, uh, then will create, uh, take those photons and make a forward modeled observation, um, usually with uh, NASA missions uh, existing such as Chandra or Future, hopefully as Lynx. Um, and another, he also has Athena, um, uh, Ecrism, Ecrism, I can't say that right, um, Axis, et cetera. Um, uh, there's also, since um, there's a lot of European uh, missions, there's a um, 60 software, which I have used to make um, uh, XM or E Rosita and XM Newton event files. And then you um, get over here and you have a mock X ray uh, image and event file, as is known in the field, um, which is really just um, um, RA, DEC, and energy at the minimum. And then you can apply all sorts of X ray analysis tools to them to make um, X ray spectra, to make. Um, uh, X-ray surface brightness profiles, et cetera. 
So why do we do this? Um, well, um, oh, first I wanted to say, um, you might be interested in, in forward modeling your own simulation into the X-ray. And um, if you are, please do contact um, us. Um, you can just, uh, contact me. Um, John is very busy with a lot of things and it's awesome to have his time, but the pipeline is not yet turnkey, especially for the CGM, it's pretty complicated. And we are interested in collaborating and starting new projects. So feel free to contact me um, and uh, we'll see what we can do. Um, and this is a great time to test, start talking about this at this, uh, at this program. Um, so some motivation of like an observation. One thing that I've been thinking a lot about uh, recently is this um, Akosh uh, Bogdan um, massive spiral, which has an X-ray halo um, uh, detected via XMM. And there's data um, such as X-ray surface pro profiles of collapsing that um, 2D image into a 1D profile um, and cutting it into like a, the soft X-ray band. Um, and also looking at the spectrum and fitting that with a metallicity and deriving a lot of information about um, the X-ray halo surrounding this spiral galaxy. And that's something that is, is existing and hasn't been really confronted by simulations yet um, directly. And um, so, you know, thinking along this line, I just want to show um, sort of uh, something I'm working on using uh, this pipeline is a uh, taking a um, uh, simulated spirals from multiple simulations. I hear uh, Dylan will be happy about this. I'm showing an illustrious TNG 100 spiral halo. And, um, you know, uh, this is the gas density. Um, and you can see it's kind of cut off here. It's, you know, from the, the cosmological volume, but like it, um, uh, uh, we just grab it from the uh, um, uh, TNG repository and just gives you the halo gas. Um, and YT has all this functionality to make an uh, idealized X-ray emission map, in this case, a soft X-ray emission map. Um, but that's not what we're, what we're doing because we are forward modeling through PyXSim, and in this case, through uh, 60 software, um, making photon in individual photons in those photon lists um, in the simplex files, which John will talk about, um, and uh, making mock spectra. And in this case, I started playing around and learning software like XSpect to, to uh, try to fit the metallicity uh, and the physical, you know, the the the, the XPEC model that gives you temperature and metallicity, um, and um, derive metallicity from this. And you know, we have we know the answer of what the metallicity is in, in these simulations, um, but we're getting an observer's metallicity to see if those those agree with um, the what is you know what we know is in the simulation and what uh, an observer will get on the outside. So that's um, an interesting example because, um, you know, I think metallicity is quite, you know, um, uncertain often um, in X-ray observations and, you know, an observer's uh, metallicity maybe is 0.1 Z solar and maybe uh, what is in the simulation could be different. And if there is a, a, a discrepancy, uh, that's important because in such a case, like, um, there's, you know, most of the X-ray, soft X-ray emission in these galactic halos comes from uh, metal lines, um, like 80 to 90%. So if your metal list you derive is wrong by a factor of a few, your inferred um, density um, is, is, is wrong because, um, you know, a 1Z solar model will be a lot less dense than a 0.1Z solar model. So then your inferred pressure of the hot halo medium impacting the formation of the cool, cool phase trace in the UV um, will be quite different. Um, and um, so that's, that's why we are doing this. And it will be an interesting, um, you know, project, um, I think, uh, to discuss these. So now I'm going to hand it off to John. And John, you will, um, we'll just keep this presentation going. And you can um, tell me, you know, give me a clue to change slides. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ben. And uh... Thanks to uh, everyone for having me here. I just want to take a few slides to sort of delve into sort of the algorithm and the process and the method for creating the uh, synthetic X-ray observations. So the, the basically the bulk of this is done by a package called PyXSim, which uh, Ben has mentioned. 
uh, it generates synthetic uh, X-ray observations from 3D models. So basically, this is simulation outputs. Ben gave a nice list of simulation outputs, or even like say toy models. And by a toy model, I mean, let's say you just like take a 3D like NumPy array and you fill it with like density, temperature, um, metallicity. You set up like a beta model or some spherically symmetric thing or something. And the way that you can read all of this kinds of data is that it uses uh, the YT package to the handle of the 3D data, whether it's like of a, a grids, whether it's a uniform grid or an adaptive mesh refinement grid, or it's a uh, Voronoi tessellation like REPO, or it's you know a, a SPH type simulation. So uh, YT is sort of the lingua franca for all of these different. Uh, Simulations. I don't have a lot of time to go into uh, a full description of YT as I'd like in this short amount of time. But basically, the point is, is that it allows you. It's a. It's intended to be a Python uh, package for analyzing all of these different types of simulation data, and allowing the user to ask and get answers to physical questions. The PyXM package itself, which uses YT for all this, is based on the original Fox approach of uh, Veronica Biffy et al. 2012, 2013, which was designed initially for uh, gadget simulations. So Ben, you can go to the next slide. So this is basically the, the Fox uh, algorithm uh, adapted for PyXM. So PyXM assumes you have like a 3D emission model of a source from a simulation, or perhaps just a 3D grid or a collection of particles. So basically, we're saying that our emitting object is, in this case, is a sphere in this schematic, that you know, uh, blue circle, and then it's filled up with volume elements. So right there, I've got a cell, but this could be like an SEH particle or a Voronoi cell, and that this uh, cell has some properties. This this you know this mass element has some properties. So it's got a density, a temperature, a metallicity. It's got a position somewhere, it's got a volume, obviously, and it's got a uh, velocity. So what PyXM does is, is that for each of these little volume elements or mass elements, it takes an emission model. So for example, it could be a thermal emission model, or it could be a power law emission model, depending on what the underlying physical process is. And then you can go to the next slide. And then what it does is it says, okay, let's assume that we have this really large exposure time in a really large collecting area. And large, of course, is defined here as in comparison to like the instrument that you, the properties of the instruments you're in, interested in simulating. And what it does is it says, okay, each one of these little volume elements has a spectrum and it ha based on the properties of that cell or a particle and then we have like a large exposure time and a large collecting area. And then for each one of those little volume elements, we generate a number of photons at the position of the little volume element. And we give them the energies from the spectrum, okay? So if you work with x-rays, you realize that uh, you're not really working in the continuum approximation. I work for Chandra and one of the things that I get to do on call sometimes is watch you can actually, I have a little screen where I can literally watch events, erect exterior events being detected by Chandra one by one for, you know, even faint sources. So that's sort of the approach that's motivated here is that we generate a large-ish Monte Carlo sample of synthetic photons. So you can go then to the next one. So then what we do is, is that we have this large sample and then we draw a subsample of this large sample. And I, before I get ahead of myself, I should say the point is, is that you can store this sample to disk, okay? So it's a sample in 3D. It's got all the photons have 3D positions. You can save that to disk and then you can project this uh, sample along to, onto a sky plane essentially as many times as you want. So the really expensive step of generating the photon energies is done and over with, you save it to disk, and then you do the projection afterwards onto a sky plane. So if you want to look at the same 3D source from lots of different projections to see what it would look like in those different projection angles. And what that does is two things. That it, A, of course, it projects everything onto, it, onto the sky plane. And the second thing it does, if you have an instrument that is 
that has high enough energy resolution to measure it is that it picks off the uh, velocity component along the line of sight and then Doppler shifts every photon in the sample. And then if you have a cosmological source, the photons are cosmologically redshifted. And one of the other things we have to do is, is that any source, you know, outside the, any source that is coming to us is going to have some of its photons uh, absorbed by galactic foregrounds, so it also takes care of that. So you can see here that you've got a little model of Chandra there, you know, you've got a particular projection. So then you can go to the next one. And I should say here, even though I don't have a slide for it, that's where it stops, okay? So you have a list, essentially, that you can write to disk in this format called Simput, which writes uh, photon position, RA and DEC, and energy. And then what happens later is that either the SOX package or the 60 package, which we'll talk about in a couple slides, can read those in and then convolve them with an instrument. So there's like a break, basically, because you might want to save this input catalog to disk, have all these simulated photons, and then say simulate with Chandra or XMM, or say, you know, Athena or Lynx, some future hypothetical mission. Um, so as far as the types of inputs, anything YT can read, simulation data sets, 3D NumPy arrays of grid, points or particles. Type of the emission models that are built in is a, a thermal model that uses AtomDB or APEC, uh, a power law model or line emission. Of course, these are there are things that you can sort of combine together, actually. So Ben, I'm going to go ahead to the next. I'm just going to show a few examples. These are the examples I will show mostly from my work. Uh, and these are mostly clusters, so they're a bit too big for this workshop, but you know, you could just sort of imagine scaling these things down. And uh, so basically what we have here is that we have a uh, couple of slices of density and temperature through a flash simulation of a galaxy cluster core where the gas is sort of moving around. Uh, we call this sloshing around in this spiral shape. So then you can go to the next one. And then what PyXM does after going through that pipeline and then convolving the list that you get out at the end with a couple of different instrument simulators is that you can get an image of the photons from that galaxy cluster. So on the left, you have uh, a Chandra image using the ACSI uh, imager. So you can see the chip gaps and everything in there, but you see the sloshing spiral there. And you see that it's very noisy because of course this is, this is X-rays. And, uh, and then you have the Athena image on the right where you can see there's like a different, uh, there's a different shape of the detector, but also it's a lot less noisy because the, the effective area of the Athena uh, mission is just a lot higher. So your statistics are far better. However, the point spread function, uh, the angular size of it is about uh, 10 times larger than uh, than Chandra is, of course, and so the image is also a bit blurrier. So you can go ahead to the next one. We'll go into the, a huge amount of detail on this slide, uh, but you can also, uh, if you have a microcalorimeter, which is basically a, a spe special type of X-ray instrument, you can make where you can you have an imager that can nevertheless measure uh, velocities. Uh, really well, which is something that mo that up till now, uh, most X-ray instruments couldn't do that. And Hitomi was able to do it, but of course it didn't last very long. So this is an example where we used PyXM to try to uh, measure the velocities in a cluster that was similar to the Perseus cluster, which Hitomi was able to measure before it met its demise. So uh, Ben, you can go next. And then here is sort of a fun toy example. Uh, this is an example where I took a uh, simulation of a cluster. So this is a cluster extracted from a cosmological box. I believe this is from one of the fire simulations. I can't remember exactly. And uh, so we have gas density and dark matter density. And then we assume, which is not true as it turns out, we assume that the dark matter particles are annihilating and that they produce this huge emission line, which doesn't actually exist, but it's a really interesting toy example. So Ben, if you go to the next slide, you can see all the blue stuff is thermal emission from the cluster. And then 
that little uh, orange line right there is actually that emission line that I added that is supposedly coming from like annihilation between dark matter particles. Now in reality, there is no emission line at that location. It would be really cool if there was, but it's just an example of uh, something that you can do with uh, PyXM. So you can go to the next one. So PyXM currently, I hope it doesn't have this forever, currently comes with some limitations. Uh, it assumes that the stuff you're working with is optically thin, so we don't have any optical thickness, absorption, or scattering. Uh, I know this is something that at other wavelengths Trident is really good at. Uh, I've bugged Cameron a couple times about this, saying we should do this sometime. Uh, it's worth thinking about. I see Cameron giving me a thumbs up, so I definitely think that's something that would be good to do. It currently doesn't simulate any sources with explicit time dependence. That would be something that might be interesting to do in the future, and then, although maybe not as relevant to this group. And then it also doesn't work with 3D data sets not in Cartesian coordinates. So uh, that's another feature that will have to come down the road is if you have like a cylindrical or a uh, spherical coordinate simulation. So go ahead, Ben, and move. So uh, basically, this is uh, how to get it. So, or, or, uh, or basically, just a couple of notes about it. So uh, the current stable version of PyXM is 2.3.0, which I just minted that release this morning, or between last night and this morning. Um, it depends on YT. If you, you can install, uh, we can talk about this more in the breakout session, but you can install it using PIP or Anaconda uh, and uh, PyXM will automatically install YT for you if you don't have it, but especially if you have SPH data, I recommend installing uh, YT from source because that will get you uh, the what is essentially a beta version of YT 4.0, which is really, really good for Lagrangian slash SPH data. Uh, Grid-based data works fine in the stable version of YT, which is what, what uh, 3.6.1, but uh, if you really want YT and uh, PyXM to work for um, the uh, SPH data, I definitely recommend 4.0. Uh, PyXM's on GitHub. There's a Google group and a mailing list. And I believe that's my last slide, Ben, if you could just go to the next one. All right. I And I will just, if you don't mind, I will just make a quick comment about this since this is also uh, my package. And then Ben can also comment here. Uh, but basically, SOX is a separate package. The two packages are related. In fact, if you download PyXM, it, it installs SOX for you because it uses stuff from SOX. And what SOX does is, is that it produces simplified simulated observations using simple models for Chandra, the proposed links, uh, Athena, Chrism, uh, a proposed mission called Axis, stuff like that. Uh, and since this is your slide, Ben, I'm going to let you take it away. But I just thought I'd sort of give us the transition there. So. Okay. Thank. Yeah. Thanks. Well, it's your code. So, um, and also, like, I should say that this is, uh, you know, John made all these this software publicly available. So you're welcome to like download this and do this on your own simulation. And um, uh, but um, you know, some of the things that uh, I'll show now are a little bit more specific and. Um, I'm I'm interested in collaborating on on things and especially in the CGM um, and have learned um, some you know from some pitfalls that um, uh, we've run into. Uh, so so Ben, do you want yeah. to do this in the breakout room? It sounds sure. like you're about to do something else. So yeah, technically the tutorial recorded time is over, but maybe this is good for a breakout yeah. room session. Awesome! Thank you guys so much. That's really interesting. Uh, yeah, I love this. Sounds like an incredibly useful tool. Okay, so the uh, the breakout room is open. X-ray obs. I think you know everybody can head over there. Like I said, DM me if you need uh, any help getting over to that room. We'll wait like two minutes for everyone to move over. How about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. And then Ben and John will get over there. And then um, yeah, I've been getting some DMs. If you were in another room and you try to go to that room, some people are having trouble. Some people seem to do it. I don't know. Maybe it depends on your version of Zoom, but I'm happy to help. I can move you directly. I have that power. Um, and uh, and I think you know you guys can continue on in the breakout room for however long. Um, 
I don't actually know about any uh, time constraints necessarily, but hopefully people are able to join. Looks like it's happening. And then otherwise, this concludes our uh, recorded plenary uh, tutorial session. 